writing has become uh, one of the most powerful means of the world uh, that we live in and understand. Uh, and it has two uh, features that we would like to focus on. Uh, originally, uh, it was a restricted form of meaning making. And as it developed, it actually became restrictive in interesting ways, even as it spread all over the world as a mode of meaning making very quickly. In fact, today, 90% uh, of the world population speak one of 20 languages. And all of these 20 languages have writing associated with them. They're the ones that have grown and dominated and filled the space of meaning making for many countries across the globe literate civilizations end up spreading. Uh, we have you know, the spread of um, uh, written Chinese through East Asia. We have the spread of writing systems through Central and um, South America. Uh, we have the spread of derivatives of the first writing of Mes Mesopotamia. So the first writing of Mesopotamia becomes um, you know, moves across to Egypt and becomes hieroglyph hieroglyphics. It moves into Europe. The first Greek um, scripts, the first European scripts is a Greek script called Linea B, um, which we've got an example of, of here in an image. Writing and the invention of the mechanisms like the printing press uh, for its uh, uh, delivery and dissemination uh, had a revolutionary change on life in very powerful kinds of ways. It influenced the way humans were organised, it influenced the way we worked, it influenced the way we related. The interesting thing is the function of writing is really only for elites. It's not for everybody. Um, and those elites use writing as part of a system of inequality. It also serves the function of religion. In Chichen Itza, you know, it was the only the, and, and in a lot of other societies, it was something that the high priest did. You know, you couldn't come to know God, but the high priests or who knew Latin or who knew, um, who were literate, uh, had this secret knowledge. So it was intricately related uh, to, um, to inequality. Very quickly, writing, became something to control meaning, to control stories, through standardization, through canonical texts. Famous anthropologist Claude Levi Strauss says, look, these were the baleful effects of writing when writing comes. It's used by to list property, um, it's used for taxation, so if the peasants are, are farming, and for um, uh, building the kind of uh, structures you can see in these images in the background of Chichen Itza, so what happens is that we have a surplus, um, there's terrible inequality, and on, the, on these images of um, Chichen Itza, you can see some of this symbolic uh, representation in the columns in these images. Writing, uh, even as early as Socrates, was seen as uh, perhaps something, in, in, in his frame of mind anyway, that might have a negative effect because it would make people lazier in their thinking, you know, uh, that their thinking capa capacity somehow would be affected by the invention of writing. Now what happens with the spread of, um, of, of writing um, uh, uh, progressively over, over several thousand years is the death of small languages. So, and by the way, that happens in Central America and South America as well. Small indigenous languages are gradually taken over uh, by the languages of the Maya and the Aztecs and these other larger civilizations in Europe. Uh, Latin becomes, uh, which is the, the written language, becomes the dialect, writes over a whole pile of smaller languages and so on. And as we move further on into the modern period, um, uh, what we have is we have the rise of the nation state. So we have this image here, which is the classical image of the modern nation state. And what nations were about were building large homogenous populations and the, uh, the theorist of nationalism, Ernest Gelder, has this very interesting way of putting it. Um, that, that individuals have to be substitutable. So if you're in a particular social role, you have to be substitutable. You know, a teacher's a teacher and a policeman's a policeman and a, a, someone who drives a bus is that. And they have to be able to communicate with strangers. So building these large nations with common languages becomes then a strong political agenda in, the modern, in modern times. And with that comes the death of small languages. And of course, one of the central instruments to achieve that is the school. So kids come to school with different dialects, different languages, maybe they're indigenous languages, maybe they're immigrant languages, but the function of schooling is to teach 
uh, literacy to teach official standard languages which everybody shares as a kind of a lingua franca. So it's a process of homogenizing uh, human languages. Now if we cast our, our minds back comparatively to uh, first languages, there the logic of identity was the logic of differentiation, uh, the logic of uh, marking the world by my specific symbolic way of, of naming things. And now we have a reversal of that and a strong tendency towards homogenization and assimilation uh, with um, uh, official languages uh, and linguistic assimilation. And in those 5,000 years since the invention of writing, what we've seen is some very particular features uh, attached to something that we've called the modern life world or modernity. Uh, writing has produced uh, the phenomena of what value is. It's produced um, knowledge that matters. Uh, it has created rules and about the kinds of skills you need and the kinds of sensibilities in order to be a literate person and a competent uh, modern person. And we also produce ways of testing these values, the knowledge and the skills and sensibilities. And in fact, it underpins, the invention of writing underpins the whole edifice of the institutionalized textbook-based education system that we are all a part of uh, in uh, the worlds in which we live.